Okay, so we're going to do PowerPoints five, six, and seven here. So intro to hepatology, viral hepatitis, and cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. I do have two changes I wanted to add. So when we were talking about H. pylori medication, there is a second combination med called Prevpac. So that's going to be the one with Lansoprazole, which is Prevacid. Then apparently this Talisha is an FYI slide, so we don't really have to focus on that. I did come up with one other mnemonic, just a silly one for a Mallory Weiss tear, which is, um, you know, like Breaking Bad, how it was like blue meth. Well, Mallory Weiss pre prefers the red crack. So that's how you can remember that. All right, so let's dive right into intro to hepatology. This is PowerPoint 5. Okay, so we're going to talk about LFTs, fatty liver disease, alcoholic hepatitis, acute liver failure, and ischemic hepatitis. So let's dive right in. So it is worth memorizing like the seven core functions of the liver. I have a mnemonic for this. It's A busties. So A B U and then S little t just to make you think of storage and then I E S because there's a second S. So the second S is synthesized. So it's A busties, A B U S little t and then I E S. I'll walk through the story for, or let me just list them first. So it's going to be angiotensinogen. So the liver makes angiotensinogen, which is a precursor to angiotensin one. So this is going to raise blood pressure. It's activated by renin. It produces bile and bilirubin. So the B is bile and bilirubin. U is that it houses the urea cycle, which converts ammonia to urea. S is going to be that it stores many things. And then there's a mnemonic in that, which is CV GIF. It's like you're giving your CV to somebody and all you do is make GIFs. So that's going to be copper, vitamins A, D, K, and B12. So no vitamin E there, um, I, I don't think. And then glycogen, iron, and fats. The And that's the ST of the mnemonic. The I is produces immune factors. The E is remove removes and excretes body waste. And then the S is going to be synthesized. And then there's a mnemonic in that, which is ACT. So it synthesizes ACT. These are your three plasma proteins, your albumin, your clotting factors, and your thrombopoietin, which creates platelets. And then albumin keeps water in the blood by exerting osmotic pressure. So when we lose albumin, which we'll talk about, water leaks out of the blood vessels, goes into the interstitium, and that's actually what creates ascites. All right, so here's the story for this. I'm pretty proud of this one. So Angelo, the mob boss, pulls up in a limo and kicks out two men into the alleyway of a nightclub. It's quite tense. So Angelo tense, that's angiotensinogen. The two men, Bill E and Billy Rubin, are in the alleyway of that nightclub. Okay, so that's bile and Billy Rubin. What are they going to do in the alleyway? Well, they're going to urinate all over the wall. So this is the urea cycle. Okay, or maybe they urinate on a, on a bicycle. They enter into the back of this venue into the storage room and Bill E hands Billy Rubin his CV. It's a job interview and he makes nothing but gifts. So they're in the storage room. This is the storage part of the liver and CV gift. So it's copper, vitamins, A, D, K, and B12, glycogen, iron, and fats. Okay. They go, they leave the storage room. They go up on stage and start throwing vaccines at the crowd. So this is immune factors. Then they start taking just a whole bunch of drugs out of their pocket. They're not taking them. They're taking them out of their pockets and throwing them away. So this is the excretion of body waste, toxins, and drugs. The only thing for them left to do is to bust out that synthesizer and perform their act. So the last thing is synthesize, and it's act. So it's albumin, clotting factors, and thrombopoietin, okay? So this is Bill E. and Billy Rubin, just, just two friends chilling. So a lot of these come up in the following PowerPoint. So it's really worth it to memorize all of those, try to recite them in that order, and it's, it's going to be useful. Okay. There's also three processes that the liver is involved with. One is glycogenesis. This is simply the conversion of glucose to glycogen. When we have excess sugar and we don't need to use it, we combine glucose together into glycogen. We store it in the liver for later. When we do need that sugar, it's called glycogenolysis. So we break down that glycogen into glucose. So if we're like in a fasting state and we need some extra sugar, glycogenolysis is going to uh, come in. 
When we run out of glucose and we need to create it, this is where gluconeogenesis comes in. So this is the creation of glucose from these non-carbohydrate precursors like lactate, you know, glycerol, fats, and then amino acids. All right. It's like, you can think of like neogenesis as a brand new creation of glucose out of nothing, because that's kind of what is happening there. The liver also digests lipids to synthesize cholesterol. Okay, sure. All right. Let's talk about LFTs. So we should become really comfortable and familiar with these. Bilirubin is on here as well. It's not very useful because it's elevated in like all of this and it's really not specific for anything, but just know that that's here. Your big three really are gonna be ALT, AST, and ALP. And then there's GGT as well. So let's kind of talk about these. So ALT, which is alanine transaminase. Um, let's do ALT and AST. And then there's AST, which is aspartate transaminase. The big relationship here, if your ALT is higher than your AST, it's most likely a hepatic cause like hepatitis. So I just think of like ALT, the L for liver, hepatitis is the inflammation of the liver. It's kind of like your classic liver issue. So if ALT is over AST, think hepatic. Um, if both ALT and AST are elevated compared to the ALP, the ALK-FAS, it's still hepatic, okay? ALT is going to be increased in viral hepatitis by 30 to 50 times. So that's a pretty big one to know. AST, if this is elevated in relation to ALT, I think it's especially with like a two to one or a three to one ratio, it's going to be from alcohol. So you can think AST, when you get drunk, you fall on your AST, your AST. So that's how you're going to remember that alcohol is the primary cause here. So drug-induced or alcohol-induced cirrhosis or hepatitis, AST is going to be up above ALT. You can also use this to evaluate liver and heart disease. It's going to be increased in liver disease 10 to 100 times. You'll have ALT over Um, I'll, that looks like it's an ALT thing. All right, we'll skip over that part. Um, but the other big three causes of an increased AST, I think these are really important. It's hypothyroidism. So you can think of like falling down. So hypothyroidism, acute MI, and tissue trauma as well. And I think of AST hat. So the hat is going to be hypothyroidism, acute MI, and tissue trauma. I think this just means here it's increased in liver disease, but you're still going to have ALT over AST as well for like acute and chronic hepatitis, uh, but I'll have to check on that. Okay. Now, ALK-FAS. If ALK-FAS is elevated, it's a biliary tract issue. It's some type of biliary tract duct obstruction. How I remember this is Bill the duck, so literally biliary duct, he's in the Alps. He's hiking on the mountain. So Alp, think of Alps. Think of Bill the Duck up on that mountain, okay? He's wearing a placenta on his back. That's kind of weird, right? And his bill, his actual duck bill, is really just soft bone. So what the heck does this mean? So ALP is going to also come from the bone, the liver, obviously, and the placenta. And then I mentioned the soft duct, the soft bill of this duck because osteomalacia can increase ALP, Okay. The other thing, while we're talking about things that are raised, ALP likes a high pH of nine. So think more alkaline. So again, high up in the Alps, pH. But bile duct is the big, big thing for ALP. Now, if you do have an increased ALP and you want to know, well, is this coming from the liver or is this coming from the bone? You run what's called a GGT, which is gamma glutamyl transferase. If ALP is up, and GGT is up, it's coming from the liver. If ALP is up and GGT is normal, then it's coming from the bone. So that's definitely going to be a question. Uh, there you go. So that's the interplay of these liver function tests. So a chronic elevation in LFTs, there's a definition here. They have to be elevated for six months or more. Less than that is acute. This is kind of what we talked about. Yeah, here's that two to one ratio of AST over ALT. That's going to suggest alcohol. ALKFAS way up in comparison to AST and ALT, biliary duct, ALT. 
uh, and AST or just ALT over, this is more suggestive. Uh, it's going to be liver. It's going to be hepatic cause, especially hepatitis. These are all the mnemonics I had for that. Cirrhosis stuff we'll get to. So if the LFTs are elevated, do some digging. A bunch of drugs can raise LFTs. NSAIDs, Tylenol, antibiotics, statins, trazodone, antidepressants. So look out for those anticonvulsants, statins, so a, really a lot of stuff. Alcohol use. Again, look for AST over ALT. Good initial test for this is just a right upper quadrant ultrasound. But you can also do a, you know, a good test for elevated LFTs. You can also do a CT or an MRI or an ERCP. So you do, you can literally do everything. All right, let's talk about fatty liver disease. I think this is one of the more complicated topics on this exam. So when you have fatty liver disease, you can either have it due to alcohol or you can have it due to non-alcohol, but they both follow the same type of spectrum. You start off with steatosis, then you upgrade to steatohepatitis, and then the third bucket is cirrhosis. So let's talk about the alcohol causes. All right. So let's talk about the metabolism. So alcohol is broken down by alcohol dehydrogenase into acetaldehyde. That is then broken down into acetate, okay? The alcoholic fatty liver pathophysiology. So the more we drink, the more alcohol dehydrogenase is released to deal with all the alcohol. And it upsets the balance of that gluconeogenesis that we were talking about. That's the generation of glucose from those non-carbohydrate sources. So that's the pathophys here with alcohol fat, alcoholic fatty liver disease is the upsetting of gluconeogenesis. All right. And then suddenly we have too many fatty acids. So that's the issue here. That's what's causing the fatty liver disease. Big vignette thing here, Kupfer cells. So as we keep drinking and keep drinking and keep drinking, these cup for cells are these macrophages in the liver. They wake up and they're like, what is happening? All right, you want to drink? I'm going to release a tumor necrosis factor alpha. So Kupfer is like so alpha, he just starts killing hepatocytes because we're drinking so much. And I think of this like, what you, you know, what do you want a cup for? So cup for another drink, you're killing me. And that's from the liver. That's from the cup for cells. So there you go. So alcoholic fatty liver disease, or, you know, the, the simpler, like first bucket is the simple alcoholic steatosis in that spectrum. It's actually almost always asymptomatic. So take a good history. It's obviously going to be caused by excessive ethanol consumption. And LFTs are actually generally normal here, especially in like this first phase. You can use ultrasound if you want to look for steatosis. At this stage, liver biopsy is rarely needed, but you can do something called an elastography. Okay. And that's going to be to check if we've graduated to the next part of the of the um, spectrum here, which is steatohepatitis. You can do elastography. And if you do that, the, biop the biopsy is going to show fat accumulation inside the hepatocytes. Okay. Treatment, just honestly stop drinking. Everything should go back to normal within six weeks. You might need to give your patient some B12 and some protein. Okay. Now let's talk about non-alcohol fatty liver disease. This is a little bit more interesting because we're not drinking here, okay? It kind of just happens. Well, we'll talk about why. Most patients are in their 40s and 50s. It's more common in Mexican and Central American descent. There are risk factors. The big one is metabolic syndrome. It's all the bad stuff. It's obesity, systemic hypertension, dyslipidemia, and insulin resistance, or just overt diabetes. So that's going to give you this fatty liver. The pathophysiology here, rather than these cup for cells and the gluconeogenesis, it's insulin resistance and an imbalance of fatty acid metabolism. So that's a big one. It's insulin resistance for non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. This is a really good picture, I think, of the spectrum of this. So you start with the steatosis. This is your non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, like proper. It's the first stage. It's the insulin resistance. To diagnose this, you need hepatic steatosis by imaging or biopsy, an exclusion of significant alcohol consumption because this is non-alcoholic, and then an exclusion of other causes like hep C, autoimmune, pregnancy, and you can use a statin to help out, especially if this patient has this metabolic syndrome, hypertension, dyslipidemia, a statin is probably a good idea. 
Now, if it gets worse and we graduate to steatohepatitis, this is where we're going to start to get lobular hepatitis. And again, in the absence of alcoholism, the big vignette here is chicken wire fibrosis. I think of, um, and steatohepatitis is also known as NASH. So non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. I think if Kevin Nash, who was like an old school wrestler with like a, a bat with like chicken wire wrapped, wrapped around it, and he was not an alcoholic. So that's going to be the big thing. Chicken wire fibrosis, it's NASH. It's steatohepatitis, and it is not from alcohol. You are going to see a mild elevation of the LFTs here, no specific ratio. And if left untreated, this can lead to fibrosis and cirrhosis, which we'll talk about a little bit later. All right. So how do we manage this? It's not coming from the alcohol. So what do we do? Weight loss. That's actually going to be the only therapy with reproducible evidence. Okay. They want to lose one to two pounds per week. And then all of the risk factors, get their blood sugar under control. If they have diabetes, get their cholesterol under control. If they have hyperlipidemia, you can use a statin here to help out. And then obviously avoid alcohol. If you start to see chickens, so if you're progressing to NASH, call for help, call GI or a hepatologist, okay? The other thing here, this is probably a test question. You also don't want things getting worse. So run a serum AFP, that's the alpha feta protein. That's a tumor marker and do a right upper quadrant ultrasound every six months. So alpha feta protein is a tumor marker for, for liver cancer, for cancer. Okay, now let's talk about alcoholic hepatitis. So this is kind of an aside from alcohol-related fatty liver disease, okay? Especially because that's asymptomatic. This is symptomatic. It does have a clinical presentation. You're going to get this if you are drinking more than 100 grams a day for greater than 20 years. And I looked it up. One standard drink is about 14 grams. That's a, that is a lot. The clinical presentation, you're going to see anorexia. You're going to see jaundice. You're going to see the right upper quadrant epigastric pain, you're going to see a fever. That's kind of a big one here. And then on your inspection, you're going to see hepatomegaly and ascites. And you're also going to see a decreased level of albumin. Remember, so the A of synth act is albumin. So if albumin is down, it can't pull water. It can't bring, keep water in the blood vessels and all of the fluid is going to get out of the blood. And that's literally what causes ascites. Okay. So look out for that. So we finally have a ratio here. We are going to have an AST to ALT of two to one or three to one. So again, fell on your ast, it's an alcohol cause. You're also going to see an elevated INR here because the C of synth act is clotting factors. So if our liver is sick and we're not producing clotting factors, our blood's going to get thinner and our INR is going to raise, Okay. The hallmark, this is a test question, the hallmark of alcoholic hepatitis is the presence of neutrophils on a biopsy. So I hope you like Harry Potter. So Argus Filch, Argus Neutro Filch, he got so drunk, he was jaundiced, febrile, he had a massive liver, hepatomegaly, and a fluid-filled gut. He fell on his ass and then neutered himself. Okay, but neutrophil neutered, it's, it's all in there. And then he bled all over the place. So an elevated INR. So when you're thinking of the hallmark of alcoholic hepatitis, think of Argus filch and neutrophilch. So neutrophils with alcoholic hepatitis. Okay, based on this laundry list of labs, this can be a clinical diagnosis. And you do want to exclude some other causes. So run a viral hepatitis panel for hep A, B, and C and then do an uh, abdominal ultrasound to look for something called Bud Chiari syndrome. So I don't know, Harry Potter, Harry and Ron were buds. So if you see something having to do with Bud Chiari syndrome, it has to do with alcoholic hepatitis, sure. Okay, treatment for this, stop drinking. We wanna hydrate them. We wanna give them nutritional support and we wanna look for infections. Okay, this is probably like six exam questions. So Madri's discriminant, function. This is the score we run for a patient with alcoholic hepatitis based on their PT and their total bilirubin. So the criteria for this is their PT and their total bilirubin. If the score is over 32, that's an indicator of a poor prognosis. Okay. Using MADRI, we can make the decision of do we treat with steroids or do we use 
pentoxifoline or Trental. So definitely a farm question. Pentoxifoline is going to be used for alcoholic hepatitis based on that Madri's discriminant function. Another exam question. We do this discriminant function, and now it's day seven. It's a week later. What do we do? We run something called a Lilly score. We run a Lilly score, if, and this score will tell us whether we should continue therapy or not. I have an awesome mnemonic for this. So Mad Eye Moody, who is Madri, and Lily Potter are setting out to help people with alcoholic hepatitis. That's so nice of them. Mad Eye is like, hey, Billy Rubin needs some physical therapy. So Madri's function measures total Billy Rubin and PT. Then Professor McGonigal and five of her clean feline friends. So Pent for five, Oxy for clean, and feline for cats. It's Pentoxifoline Trenthal is going to be the med of choice with Madri's if we're not using steroids. And then Lily Potter is like, I'm going to go away for a while. I'm going to come back for book seven. So we run a Lily score on day seven. Let's talk about acute liver failure. Okay, so there's a pretty strict definition here. Now, we saw the raised INR in alcoholic hepatitis. We're going to see that as well, but it has to be greater than 1.5. The patient has to not have pre-existing cirrhosis, and this is the huge one. They're going to have encephalopathy. Okay, causes of acute liver, liver failure, hepatitis, drug-induced like a Tylenol or antibiotic overdose, and then other random stuff like heat stroke is in there. Big symptoms, you're going to have like general stuff like jaundice, scleral icterus, but change in mental status. When you see a change in mental status, think hepatic encephalopathy, it's acute liver failure. So there's one question right there. You're also going to get some itching. Okay, for encephalopathy, look for behavioral changes, cerebral edema, look for pupil changes. I don't know if we need to know this grading system, um, but... But they're normal with the grade one, with grade two or three, the pupils are going to be hyper responsive. So if you see somebody with hyper responsive pupils, it's going to be from hepatic encephalopathy, from acute liver disease. If they're slow to respond, not a good sign. It's going to be grade uh, from grade two to four, and grade four is a coma, okay? The other big thing for hepatic encephalopathy is asterixis which is like flappy wrists. I think it's like a dorsiflexion, dorsiflexion issue. So look out for that as well. So tons of vignette stuff here. The labs for acute liver failure. Again, that INR greater than 1.5 is part of the definition. We also want to look for thrombocytopenia. Again, the synth act mnemonic of one of the functions of the liver to synthesize. The T is thrombopoietin. That is going to create white blood cells. So if the liver is sick and we're not creating those, we're going to see thrombocytopenia, which is a low level of, of platelets. Okay. We can run an ammonia, but only once. That's definitely going to be a question of how many times, you know, do you trend in ammonia with acute liver failure? No, just run it once. Okay. Okay, so the thrombocytopenia, which we were just talking about, is due to something called splenic sequestering. So the whole idea of portal vein pressure rising, it, to me, it's like similar to the backup in the heart with like heart failure or core pulmonale. So the liver is failing. It can't handle slash push out blood. So once it receives all the blood that it needs to perform work on from the portal vein, it needs to process all of that and then send it out. So if there's portal vein backup and pressure increases... Um, that's causing the splenic sequestering. I don't even know if that makes sense to me. Yeah, the liver is too sick to process blood fast enough. So this, the spleen is getting overwhelmed. You get these low platelets, M make it make sense. So yeah, we talked about thrombopoietin again. Okay, so how do we treat acute liver failure? Well, we're gonna withhold hepatotoxic medications. Again, one of the big causes here is drug-induced. So if they overdosed on Tylenol, don't give them Tylenol. If that was the cause, we're going to give them N-acetylcysteine or NAC. So N-acetylcysteine. So ALF, acute liver failure, ALF. This was a TV. This was even before my time in like the 70s or 80s or something. So if ALF's liver, fa liver is failing from Tylenol, take them to a new church like the Cysteine Chapel. 
So cysteine, acetylcysteine, NAC, that's going to be acute liver failure, okay, uh, due to acetaminophen. The other thing here is just support them. It's a 40% recovery rate. So correct their labs, watch their blood pressure, you know, et, et cetera. Okay. The last topic here is ischemic hepatitis. Oh, there's only three slides on this. This is an acute liver injury caused from a decreased hepatic blood flow. So it is not mediated by an inflammatory process. That's really important because hepatitis is in the name, but it's ischemic. You're going to see an elevation in liver function tests following a hypotensive episode. So some type of shock, some type of cardiac event, some type of trauma, the liver's not getting enough blood, it becomes ischemic. And it's also known as a shock liver. Two big labs here, you're going to see a rapid rise in serum aminotransferase, and you're going to see a massive rise in lactate dehydrogenase. You might mnemonic for this. So you're going to look at me and you're going to tell me that I'm wrong. You come in here, you try to transferase my aminos, you try to dehydrogenase my lactate. Frankly, I'm so shocked that my liver has become ischemic. If I remember that on the test, I'm going to just laugh out loud. So hopefully that works. So yeah, so look for those two labs on a vignette. It's going to be his ischemic hepatitis. It's going to be your shock liver. Okay, here's a little recap of what we just went over. A lot of these, if I'm being honest, I get confused. So I with like with, hey, what bucket does this go in? So it's helpful for me to make these columns and know that, okay, here's all the Harry Potter stuff with alcoholic hepatitis. That's my Madri. That's my Lily. That's my AST over ALT. That's my ascites and hepatomegaly. Acute liver failure, all the purple stuff here. That's my encephalopathy. That's my change in mental status. Don't trend my ammonia. This is where my acetylcysteine is. You know, the alcoholic fatty liver disease versus non-alcoholic. You know, just knowing, hey, coop for cells are over here on the left. Insulin resistance is to the right of that. These are two different mechanisms. Chicken wire, this is in my, my non-alcoholic. So I think that's gonna help you kind of look at the differences between these and don't get confused. Okay, let's move right on to uh, viral hepatitis. I didn't outline this as much. I just have this matrix here. So let's just kind of hit the high yield things. Okay, so hepatitis A, it's going to be acute only. You can remember that as A for acute. International travel is actually the number one risk factor here, okay? It's going to be the fecal oral route, so like H. pylori. The gold standard is the IgM anti HAV, which is hepatitis V. That's the gold standard. If that comes back positive, they have hep A right now. So IgM, anti-HIV, if it comes back positive, they have it right now. If we do a total anti-HIV antibody, it means they had it at some point and they're now immune. Okay. So if they have the anti-antibody, anti-HIV antibody, not the IgM, it means they've had it at some point, okay? Hep A does not increase the risk of cirrhosis. Your patient just wants to wash their hands, don't prepare any food, and the treatment is going to be supportive, and you can give them anti antiemetics. Okay, hepatitis B. Underly underlying liver disease is the number one risk factor here. This is going to be common in sexual contact, IV drug use. And the most common route is maternal fetal. Uh, not, I'm sorry. The most common is sexual contact and IV drug use. Maternal fetal is also possible, okay? You have this prodromal phase. So before it kind of presents, you're going to have hives and rash. Okay, this is where we have all this antigen craziness. So you have the HBSAG. S stands for surface uh, and serologic. That's your gold standard here. So HBSAG is the best thing. Now, you can run an HBCAG. C stands for core. C also means current. This means they currently have it. You can also run an HBEAG. The E stands for envelope. I like to think of like sending infected envelopes to a bunch of people. The envelope tells you, hey, how infectious is this right now? Is this able to replicate? Are you sending a lot of letters to a lot of people? That's where en the envelope comes into play. AG just stands for antigen for these. Hep B is a semi-double-stranded DNA. Sure. Uh, so again, yeah, S is the surface. That's our serologic hallmark. It's going to be elevated for one to 10 weeks, it looks like. C for core, they currently have Hep B. 
okay? If the HBV surface antibody is positive, it actually means they're immune to hepatitis B. So again, that's why this is the gold standard. The surface means they're, they're immune, okay? Treatment for this is just supportive. Okay, now acute can graduate to chronic hepatitis B. This, again, our surface antigen, if it's positive for more than six months, then they have a chronic issue. Now, what can make this become chronic? Well, if they're older, if they have high levels of hep B DNA, if they're a drinker, if they're also infected with like hep C or hep D or HIV, many of the chronic hep B patients are asymptomatic, but it can progress to decompensated cirrhosis. Okay. The important thing here, this is 100% a test question. Hep B can get cancer first and then cirrhosis. I like my mnemonic better for hep C, so I'm going to talk about that when we get to hep C. And hep B can present with the stigmata of liver disease from very late stage cirrhosis. Okay. Now let's talk about hep C. This again is common in IV drug users and blood transfusions. Historically, it can also be maternal fetal. The vast majority are asymptomatic. And also uh, Central East Asia, Africa, Middle East. So you're going to have some, you know, people from these areas. And I guess traveling to these areas as well. The HCV antibody test, this is on, you know, preventative medicine. If that's negative, there's no current infection. If it's positive, then we're going to check their RNA. Okay, so it's kind of like a two-step there. There is no vaccine available for hep C. And we're going to test every adult once. We're going to do every pregnancy and then if they're high risk as well, okay? Treatment initiate no sooner than 12 weeks from exposure. Now, acute hep C can also graduate to chronic hep C, okay? Most symptoms here are going to be due to cirrhosis. The most common cause of death here is also from cirrhosis, which can then progress to cancer. Here's my mnemonic, hep C, it's the big C. So literally look at the words hepatitis and C. The second part of that word is the C, which is the big C, which is cancer. So cancer comes second. So the cirrhosis comes first. I know that also starts with a C, but think about the big C is cancer. So hepatitis C, you're going to have C on the right, which is going to be uh, cancer. I think of like hep kind of like hop, like drinking a beer and you can kind of put cirrhosis with that. So that, that's how I remember this. Hepatitis B, you can think B is the second part of that B, beer, cirrhosis. But I just think big C, it's on the right. It's the second part. Cancer comes last in terms of hep C, okay? All right, best predictor for cancer risk here is inflammation and fibrosis in a liver biopsy. That makes sense. You're going to see this in like 40 to 55-year-old males with HIV, marijuana, alcohol, Viral factors are all going to be at risk for cirrhosis from hep C. Treatment, fatigue management, avoid NSAIDs, and limit Tylenol. Um, you know, because you're going to get cirrhosis first, you don't want to overtax the liver. So that makes sense. Okay. Hepatitis D and E. D and B. Uh, okay. Hold on. D can only occur in the presence of hep B. So it's right above it in this matrix. There's a guy named D.B. Cooper who jumped out of an airplane. So just think D and B go together. D and B or Dave and Buster's too. Okay, D and B go together. All you need to know. Hepatitis E is worrisome in pregnancy. So I think pregnancy, done. There's two exam questions right there. So hep E infection during pregnancy is associated with more severe infection, may lead to fulminant hepatic failure and maternal death. You definitely don't want that. We mentioned this before, but B and C are the most common causes of cirrhosis because before Christ BC, everyone had cirrhosis, okay? But we'll learn later that B can occur without the presence. Um, I messed up in writing that, so I'll wait till we get to the cirrhosis part for that. So just think B and C are the most common causes of cirrhosis, but just know uh, in which one, like which one, which one comes first in terms of the cancer thing. Okay, let's go right on to cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. Here's what's on the docket for this. So cirrhosis, which is, we're gonna talk in general, compensated versus decompensated complications of it. And then we'll talk about hepatocellular carcinoma. 
All right. So remember when we talked about this in terms of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, we didn't really talk about cirrhosis. Now we're going to talk about cirrhosis. All right. It's defined or it's characterized by a progressive hepatic fibrosis, a distortion of hepatic architecture, and a formation of regenerative nodules. So you distort, you create fibrosis, and then you regenerate. That's kind of how I remember that. In early stages, cirrhosis can be reversible. In late stages, it's not reversible. Okay, common causes of cirrhosis. We mentioned this before, hep B and hep C, because before Christ, everyone had cirrhosis, alcoholic liver disease, and non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Okay. And this list actually accounts for 80% of the people waiting for a liver transplant. So pretty, pretty crazy. Okay. There's not so common causes of cirrhosis. One of them is hemochromatosis. This is definitely going to be a question. Now, remember, iron storage is part of the Busty's mnemonic. Remember when we were in the storage room, S&T, and we gave our CV with all the gifts on it? The I of CV GIF within the storage is iron. So, the, the, so if our liver is sick, the problem here is that with an increased intestinal iron absorption, um, sorry, with hemochromatosis, the liver is going to store too much iron. And you're going to do an iron panel. So you're going to see elevated serum iron. You're going to see ferritin. You're going to see low total iron, iron, total iron, iron binding capacity. Okay, and if that's high, you can do a hemochromatosis gene study as well. So just remember, iron panel, hemochromatosis, it's excess iron throughout the entire body. I think it's in the liver, but it's also throughout all other tissues as well. Okay, the other big one here is Wilson's disease. This is with an abnormal storage of copper in the liver and elsewhere. Remember the C in storage in that CV gifts mnemonic is copper. So we have copper, we have iron. You can do blood work for this with a serum ceruloplasmin, and you can look for the Kaiser Fleischer rings. So that's a big one. It's the copper rings around the iris, which I think you have to stain to actually see. But I think of Dr. Wilson from House. He's counting his copper pennies, and he used to work for the healthcare corporation, Kaiser Permanente. So Kaiser Fleischer rings. So here they are, hereditary hemochromatosis, Wilson disease. These are uncommon causes of cirrhosis. Okay, if you still haven't found the cause of cirrhosis, you can look for medication causes. So methotrexate and isoniazid, which is used for tuberculosis, they can nuke your liver. And then the alpha-1 antitrypsin deficiency, which we learned about causing COPD, can cause cirrhosis as well. So if you have a patient with like unexplained emphysema, then they can also have cirrhosis as well. So yeah, you definitely don't want that. So with compensated cirrhosis, there's no defined complication, complications. So you're either asymptomatic or you just have nonspecific symptoms. Decompensated cirrhosis, there's a lot of problems, okay? There are three main categories, but we only talk about the first two. It's processing problems versus portal hypertension. So let's talk about processing problems first. So in normal bilirubin pathology, your red blood cells die after their 120-day lifespan, and they're transported to the spleen. Macrophages break down the heme that are in these red blood cells into unconjugated or indirect bilirubin, which is not water-soluble. Our friend albumin comes by, which you know is synthesized, by the liver and binds to the unconjugated indirect bilirubin. And now it's water soluble. That's pretty awesome, right? So now our water soluble unconjugated indirect bilirubin is transported to the liver where it combines with glucuronic acid and then it makes conjugated direct bilirubin. That's what we want. We want the conjugated direct bilirubin at, at the end of this process. Now the processing problems can cause a defect in this. Here's what happens. If we have liver disease, we're unable to conjugate to glucuronic acid. So we can't make conjugated direct bilirubin. It causes an increase of unconjugated indirect bilirubin. So these five are the causes of an increase in unconjugated. We can have hemolysis. So there's a destruction of red blood cells 
So there's just too many dead red blood cells for the spleen to kind of keep up with. So there's just all this indirect bilirubin, all right? Because heme just keeps being broken down and there's just all this indirect unconjugated bilirubin, okay? Gilbert syndrome, this is an exam question. This is a genetic disorder where we lack an enzyme in this conjugation pathway and it is an increase in unconjugated indirect bilirubin. My mnemonic for this, Gilbert is pronounced kind of like Javert from Les Mis. He was putting people like John Valjean in prison like crazy. And Javert revokes conjugal visits because he's an ass. So Gilbert's unconjugated indirect bilirubin. Okay. <laughs> Ridiculous. If a patient just has liver dysfunction and decreased albumin, albumin can't make the unconjugated indirect bilirubin water soluble. So that's going to increase it as well. And the liver, if the liver simply just can't conjugate bilirubin for whatever reason. So those are the five causes of unconjugated indirect bilirubin. Now there's two things that can cause an increase in that end product of conjugated direct bilirubin. The first one is hepatobiliary disease. So we have our conjugated direct bilirubin, we just can't get rid of it. And also if there's a bile obstruction, conjugated bilirubin is just going to back up because we can't secrete this through bile, right? That's kind of, that's the idea here. The clinical result of either of these is going to be jaundice. Look for it under the tongue first, because it usually takes two to three, uh, a bilirubin level of two to three for the skin and mucous membranes to yellow. Okay. Another processing problem. This is a big one. It's processing ammonia. So in normal physiology, when amino acids are metabolized, ammonia is created, which is then converted to urea by the liver for excretion. So remember the U of busties is the urea cycle and E is excretion of waste. So the, if the liver is not sick, um, if the liver is sick, then ammonia is going to build up and hepatic encephalopathy is going to result. Now we learned about hepatic encephalopathy with, it was what, acute liver failure. Yes, that was the big one for acute liver failure. Remember, that was the one with the INR greater than 1.5. They have the encephalopathy and they don't have pre-existing cirrhosis. So making connections. You can look for this asterisk with this. I think I spelled that wrong. Um, so that's going to be, you know, that's going to be like a hallmark to look for if this is the issue. Okay. We talked about the confusion and altered state of consciousness. It can even appear like a coma if it's severe enough. Remember that stage four is a coma. The ammonia, it's going to cross the blood brain barrier and it's neurotoxic to brain cells. So that's the path behind this. Now we can tip the scales and cause this if we suddenly have a bunch of amino acids. So if we suddenly eat a bunch of protein and we have all these amino acids, amino acids are going to be broken down uh, it, you know, into ammonia and the urea cycle can't keep up with it all. So that's going to be a problem. If we have a GI bleed, blood is high in protein. So if we're digesting our own blood, it's going to be a big increase in amino acids and then in just infection as well. There are some others, but I think those are the big three. The first line here for hepatic encephalopathy is lactulose, which is actually a laxative. So basically, it's going to flush out the gut and it's going to decrease ammonia production by our gut bacteria. It's also going to draw ammonia from the blood into the colon. It also lowers the pH, making a more acidic environment, which means a molecule will actually gain protons. This is kind of weedy. Um, but NH3 becomes, actually, no, it's not weedy because NH3 picks up a proton and becomes NH4 ammonium. Which, which is awesome. So if we actually make a more acidic environment, we're going to get rid of ammonia because we're going to throw on another hydrogen and make NH4. We want three to five loose stools per day on this. So that's kind of our target for laxatives. Wow, that's a lot. So here's my little mnemonic. So ammonia in the brain can cause hepatic encephalopathy. So you will be lacking. You'll have confusion. You have altered state of consciousness. So you want to lose your lack. If you're lacking, you want to lose that lack. So lack to lose, lack to lose is the treatment for hepatic encephalopathy, all right? Okay, so that's processing problems. Now we need to talk about portal hypertension, okay? So portal hypertension is that is that second cause here, and this can happen in two ways. Uh, sorry, so the, the 
let me just read what I have. The main path here is through simple vascular resistance due to a decreased vessel diameter. So it's like a mechanical issue. This can happen in two ways, just a mechanical issue with fibrosis or, and this is an interesting one, a decrease of nitric oxide, which is a vasodilator. Okay, that's pretty interesting. That could definitely be a, a question for sure. Nitric oxide, a decrease, causes portal hypertension in the bucket of cirrhosis. All right, we can see things like caput medusae, which we learned about in H&P. That's going to be around the umbilical vein and its tributaries. And then we're also going to have this other cast of characters here. So ascites, which can be complicated by spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. We have esophageal varices as well. And then we have hepatorenal syndrome. So let's talk about each of those. So ascites. So again, we were talking about that albumin. We're talking about synth act and the A in that. If the liver is sick, fluid is going to leave the blood and enter the interstitium because we're losing the osmotic pull of albumin. To treat ascites, this is huge. This is another exam question. All right. We want to avoid alcohol. We want to avoid salt and we want to diurese. These are the two meds. We want to do furosemide, which is Lasix. That's a loop diuretic. And we want to do spironolactone, which is aldactone. That's a potassium sparing diuretic. You want your patient on both of these. And there's a very important ratio. This is going to be a question. So we want 40 milligrams of furosemide or Lasix for every 100 milligrams of aldactone. So how are we going to remember that? Well, fur, furosemide already kind of sounds like four. So I think of four, four osamide or 40 osamide. And then just it's out of 100. So the other med, which is aldactone, is just out of 100. So furosemide, 40 osamide. It's 40 of furosemide or Lasix. All right, for every 100 of spironolactone. We can also do a paracentesis because we want to avoid something called spontaneous bacterial peritonitis. Speaking of that, let's talk about it. So we're still within the umbrella of um, portal hypertension, a cause of decompensated cirrhosis. The definition of spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is an infection of pre-existing ascitic fluid without an intra-abdominal source. You're going to suspect this if the patient has cirrhosis and ascites, a fever with abdominal pain, and a change in mental status, hepatic encephalopathy, okay? We can diagnose SBP with a paracentesis and look for neutrophils. This has a high mortality rate. And because of this, we actually want to start empiric antibiotics before our cultures come back. Here, here are the med options. This is what we do. So empirically, we start cephotaxime. This is a third-gen cephalosporin. Remember, as you go from first gen to fourth gen, you lose gram positive coverage and you gain gram negative coverage. So we're, we're three. So we still kind of have both. That's why this is broad spectrum coverage. Okay. So you call the taxi cephotaxime while you wait for the limo, while you wait for the cultures to come back. Okay. Now there's higher resistance rates with weekly dosing. Apparently they give these next two daily because you want to put them on prophylactic antibiotics biotics after diagnosis, like forever, I'm not really sure. But this is the other two you want to give them. And it appears that we're giving them daily. So it's Bactrim. So it's trimethoprim, sulfamethoxazole, Bactrim, and ciprofloxacin, which is, a, which is a fluoroquinolone. Okay, here's my mnemonic for this. So you're just chilling one day and your gut just opens up spontaneously. And this little creature pops out. His name is spontaneous bacterial peri. And he's like, hey, I'll leave you alone, but you got to open the back door of the bar so I can get my sip on. And bro, you know I do that every day. So the treatment for spontaneous bacterial peritonitis is back trim um, oh, or ciprofloxacin daily. I thought it was, oh, it is or. You can give either of these. So it's not both. I'm pretty sure that is... Correct. Let's double check. Let's look for Cipro. Yeah, it is or. So Bactrim or, or Cipro. Where's my screen? Here we go. Okay, good. Glad we clarified that. All right. More complications that are involved with portal hypertension, which can cause cirrhosis. 
So esophageal varices. So 90% of those with portal hypertension develop varices and 30% of those will experience bleeding. The most common location for this is the gastroesophageal junction. So again, it's all about that lower third of the esophagus. It's bolded twice. So the most common location for esophageal varices is the GEJ, the gastroesophageal junction. That's where the vessels have the thinnest walls and that's where hemorrhages are going to happen. Okay. Any patient with cirrhosis should have an EGD to look for varices. We mentioned this in PowerPoint 3, but patients have a 60 to 80% chance of rebleeding, and a third of those are fatal. So this is, this is really bad. All right, the treatment for this. We talked about this a little bit with GI bleeds and acute bleeding. The treatment was going to be octreotide, which is sandostatin. For more chronic issues, like to, or to like to manage this with somebody who has portal hypertension, you want to give them a non-selective beta blocker. So you want to give them natalol, which is Corgard, or propranolol, which is Inderol. These are those first-generation non-selective beta blockers. Okay. So just you know, don't forget octreotide. That's from another PowerPoint. That's about like the active bleeding. So just don't forget that. But that's that was not mentioned in this PowerPoint. So yeah, do an EGD every two to three years for these patients um, once they're diagnosed with cirrhosis or portal hypertension. And then I think I mentioned, I don't know if I mentioned the ligation or banding during an endoscopy can be used as well. Okay. The last of the cast of characters is hepatorenal syndrome. This is kind of the end of the road for patients with cirrhosis. It's hepatorenal syndrome is liver failure so bad that your kidneys are giving up. So it has a pretty poor prognosis and that's really it. So this is both of what we just talked about. We have decompensated cirrhosis, processing problems on the left. We have the causes of increased and unconjugated, uh, we have increased unconjugated indirect bilirubin. That's your, your, Gil, your Gilbert syndrome. We have the increased conjugated direct bilirubin. That's your hepatobiliary disease. And then you have your ammonia processing issue. That's your hepatic encephalopathy. Treat it with lactulose. On the right side, it's portal hypertension. So know about your ascites, know about your SBP, know about your varices, and know about your hepatorenal syndrome. All right, we're almost done. We just have to talk about, oh my gosh, cirrhosis and hepatocellular carcinoma. I'm going to be late for class. Okay, let's kind of speed through it a little bit. Uh, all right, so cirrhosis, we're going to pull labs. What are we going to see? AST and ALT are increased, no notable ratio. ALKFOS is elevated, but not too crazy. It's less than three times. Bilirubin is going to be usually normal. Bilirubin is boring. As we talked about, albumin levels will fall. That's what causes ascites. However, this is not specific for liver disease. Look for coagulopathy. Look for those elevated INRs. Okay, we talked about that. The C of synth act is clotting factors. So our blood is getting thinner, our INR is getting higher. Sodium is another one. We have all this fluid build, build up, so there's dilution. So we have hypervolemia and hyponatremia, okay? You're gonna see that thrombocytopenia, just not or not less than 50,000, or I think it is less than 50,000, but just know that that's like a threshold there. Um, you're gonna get splenic sequestering, which we talked about, because we have that thrombo poietin. And then finally, we have anemia. So you have microcytic deficiency with iron deficiency. You have macrocytic deficiency with folate B12. So I think of micro, like those small iron golf clubs at mini golf and macro, you know, the B and B12 is big. To diagnose cirrhosis, you can just do an abdominal ultrasound. That's going to be your initial test. If your ultrasound notes surface nodularity and increased echogenicity with irregular appearing areas, you've got cirrhosis. If it's advanced, the liver is actually going to appear smaller, okay? If you do find nodules on your ultrasound, you can do an MRI to see if they're benign or malignant. You can't really see the difference on an ultrasound. The gold standard of all of this, however, is just going to be to do a liver biopsy. But if it wouldn't change your management, there's no reason to do it. Okay, this is extremely important. There are two systems to establish severity with cirrhosis. The first one is the child Pew. We talked about this in esophageal varices. It's best used for dose adjustments for medications. Okay. If it's between a five and six, it's an A. It's well decompensated. I'm sorry, it's well 
compensated, A is going to be good. If it's greater than 10, so 10 to 15, it's a grade C and it is decompensated. So again, this is for dose adjustments for meds if a patient has cirrhosis. The more important one, and this is going to be a test question, is the MELD score. This is the model for end-stage liver disease. I think the grading is from 6 to 40. The important thing here, it's used for short-term survival, and it's used for the liver transplant list. Okay, It's going to estimate disease severity, survival, and transplant. So the MELD score, it predicts short-term. It's like making a quick tuna melt, tuna meld. All right, with some nice fresh new liver on it. So liver transplant. This is going to use a lot of criteria, bilirubin, creatinine, INR. They keep adding new stuff to it, like sodium, if you're a female, albumin, creatinine cutoff, et cetera. But, you know, definitely know the MELD score and what it's for. Okay, the last topic is hepatocellular carcinoma. Only six slides on this. It's a primary cancer. It can come before cirrhosis for hepatitis B. Cancer can come before cirrhosis. Yes, yeah, we definitely, let me get rid of that. Yeah, because cancer comes first in hep B. Hep C, the big C comes second. Risk factors for this, hep B, which can occur without the presence of cirrhosis. We have hemochromatosis, hep C, alcoholic fatty liver disease. I'm sorry, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. We have alpha feta protein. So that's an, uh, another tumor marker. I think we actually already mentioned that. So detect early. So if you see an AFP, it's going to be hepatocellular carcinoma. The most common physical sign of liver cancer is hepatomegaly. That's probably going to be a question as well. And you're going to use the TNM system, which we use for non-small cell lung cancer to stage this. Okay, that's it. There's still two PowerPoints left. This exam is crazy, but that's it for now. Good luck. And I'll see you in the next one.